Hello, welcome to evolvedness.org explained. My name is Dr. Darshan Arvais, and I'm here with uh, Suzanne Arms today. And today we're discussing one component of the nest, uh, birth uh, and per soothing perinatal experiences. At evolvednest.org, we discuss and describe how humans evolved to be nested. And the nest for young children helps optimize children's development. What do we mean by optimization, by child thriving? <clears throat> thriving includes physical health, happiness and well being, self acceptance and self control, self confidence, emotional intelligence, social skills, empathy, perspective taking, kindness, and active curiosity. We've identified nine components of the nest, of humanity's evolved nest. Many of these components then are related to these wonderful positive outcomes. And these components include soothing gestation and birth, on request extensive breastfeeding, positive moving touch, no negative touch, a welcoming social climate, self-directed play with multiple age playmates, warmly responsive nurturing from mother and others, nature immersion and connection, and healing practices to repair miscommunication or hurts. So all these components are going to foster the thriving that we expect humans to have, thriving children and adults. Now today we're talking about birth or soothing perinatal experiences, and we have Suzanne Arms here with us. Welcome, Suzanne. It's good to be here. Suzanne Arms is a journalist, activist, and author. She's a pioneer in bringing awareness to childbirth and the founder of the nonprofit Birthing the Future, an organization that has films and other information about birth. Please check it out, Birthing the Future. She was among the first to open our eyes to the harmful, monetary-driven, and not evidence-based procedures and practices in medicalized birth that undermine the otherwise sacred bonding between mother and child during naturalistic birth. She considers birth in the perinatal period as the source of many of our problems of these times, whether psychosocial, ecological, economic, health, or spiritual. Her most famous book, Immaculate Deception, was selected as the best book of the year by the New York Times and sold over a quarter million copies. So we're very excited to have you here Suzanne, uh, you are our expert on birth, and we are delighted to be able to talk about this important issue with you. Welcome. Thank you. One of the reasons I'm an expert is I didn't do it well myself, so I really wanted to understand what happened <laughs> and how could it be different and why uh, what happened happened and was it happening to other women too and other babies. So how should it happen? You want to tell us that? I think we get a lot of images about how how poorly it does happen and people get so afraid because they see right. all these media well, images. I, tell us more. I think the first thing for people to understand is that um, nature does a really good job of getting a baby inside a woman's body. And it also does a really good job of getting the baby out again. <laughs> it knows how to do that. It's, it's called innate intelligence. And our cells, even if we had a cesarean for our own birth or a very complex birth, uh, our cells still know how to birth a baby. And babies know how to birth themselves and they're not passive unless they are drugged because the mother's been given drug. They're very active participants in the process. So an ideal birth is you wait until the baby is ready to be born because there's something the baby's brain secretes, we don't know what it is, that causes labor to begin. And, uh, and that's the appropriate time for it to be born. And it's somewhere between 36 and a half weeks and 42 and a half to 43 weeks uh, after gestation. So, so there's doctors, a range. So when they uh, establish a due date, that's really a guess. It right. really is. It's, it's a do five weeks or a do six weeks. And it, it puts people in a state of anxiety thinking the baby needs to come on a particular day. And so an, in an, a physiological or biologically driven birth, things happen according to the way nature has designed it. And um, that can mean 
between two hours of labor and two days, three days of labor. Depends on the woman, the baby, the way the baby is lying, and depends on <clears throat> whether the mother has a lot of anxiety, whether there are a lot of people present who are unfamiliar to her, and whether she's in an unfamiliar environment. But in a spontaneous birth, nothing is added to push or slow down this process. And uh, the mother has enough privacy, quiet, support, which may include loud singing or chanting or yelling, you know, all kinds of things. But within her own personal, familial, and cultural context, she really lets go into this process. And the baby slides down from the open cervix down what becomes the birth canal, which is when the cervix is fully open and, go, and it joins the vagina and becomes a birth canal. And uh, the woman is on her hands and knees, her side, standing, squatting, kneeling, never lying on her back because women don't choose to lie on their back for birth because it hurts more. And the contractions are less effective and longer. So who would want that? So it, it's, a, it's a series of rhythmic process, rhythmic contractions that open up the woman's cervix and then help the baby make its way down the birth canal. And of course, the um, uterus is the strongest muscle in the body at that time. And so the mother isn't in pain necessarily, right? Uh, no, she is not. <clears throat> she's not necessarily in pain. It's intense. And uh, for those that it's not intense, it can be dangerous. In other words, if, if it doesn't cause a woman to pay attention and stop what she's doing, she could be in a dangerous situation. So labor's designed it to get her attention, but it's not designed to be cruel or to be constant pain. In fact, it's a rhythmic up and then sliding down the other side. So all the words we use are wrong and all of the images we use are wrong. And, um, and the hormones are going to help her then feel more the hormones, the right? hormones. I've, yeah, the I've hormones. had uh, moms come to my class and say, oh, I would love to keep giving birth all the time because it was just ecstasy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is, you know, the, the woman's own hormones are meant to both take the edge off the intensity and also give her this supreme sense of, power and um, connection to her baby and joy. And uh, so, yeah. And as the baby comes out in a normal biological state, it would take a few minutes or seconds for the woman to really get what is happening. And because she'd be stunned and she, the baby would be between her legs and she would then reach down and bring the baby up to her chest. And that baby, or bring the baby up onto her abdomen. And then the baby would start seeking the breast, the breast and the eyes of the mother. And some babies actually will look around the whole room and stop at each person's face as if to say, thank you, I know you. So the other piece about normal birth, physiological birth is that Breastfeeding is a normal part of birth. It actually is a requirement of the baby and it's, it's the completion of the process. So birth starts, we don't even know where to say it starts because uh, does it start with the first contraction? Well, that can be weeks before the cervix opens. Does it start with the cervix opening? Does it start with the mucus plug that covers the cervix um, coming down and this, what we call a bloody show? So. It's really all a process, it's a continuum. And I like to say birth starts preconception as the egg and the sperm are getting ready to mate and create this baby. And depending on how much joy there is and how much stress there is or toxins in the environment or in that person's um, body and emotions, the egg and the sperm get altered. And we call that epigenetic changes. So you can have a baby that is much more prone to being a high stress toddler as a result of a father who was in a great deal of anxiety or perhaps drinking a lot 
um, in the couple of weeks before his sperm were released. We didn't know that. We knew the egg changed the ovum, but we didn't know the father's sperm was just as important. So all of this is a continuum of processes and anything that interrupts that's not necessary causes harm. And even things that are necessary need to be repaired. So even if it's a necessary cesarean, even if it's necessary for the baby to be separated across the room while some extra work is being done on it because it's not breathing, usually the baby will breathe just from being on the mother's chest and just from being in the air that is colder than the inside of her body. But even if that happens, there's all kinds of ways that you can get the process going again. So it's all is not lost if someone has a lot of interruptions and artificiality in birth. That's a long way of answering it. No, but it's uh, very, uh, it gives us the image, the images we need to actually replace all the negative stuff with what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. Now, let me just give you an example. When I gave birth, I went to the hospital about 12 hours after my waters broke, membranes ruptured, because the doctor wanted me there. It was a natural childbirth doctor. It was the only natural childbirth hospital in San Francisco. But I happened to get a labor and delivery nurse who was an army nurse. I happened to be late going down into the basement with no windows. And the first thing she did when she looked at me, because I was very frightened, I was afraid I was going to die in birth because I had almost died in my own birth which is another story. And that had never been dealt with and I didn't know the story, but my body knew it. So I was tense. She slapped me on the arm. She said, you're tense. And bam, gave me an injection of a drug that slowed the labor and was a narcotic and went straight to the baby. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so I'm glad to be talking about this. Yeah, that's one way things can go off the rail then. And there's yeah. so many ways, right? So many ways and so many ways to heal it if people can identify that it wasn't as good as it should have been for the baby and for the mother because they're both having separate experiences and yet they're both one being during that whole period of time from conception well past birth, as long as the mother's breastfeeding and especially if they're sleeping side by side, that mother and baby are one biological unit. What you do to one affects the other. So maybe we should talk about a few things that can go wrong. And then uh, I don't know if you want to couple it with how to repair it later or to do that. We, could, we could do that. And you had asked me to come up with five, four or five advice points or recommendations <laughs> yeah. for parents and I immediately froze because I do better on spontaneous conversations and then two days later I came up with five points all right <laughs> so I do want to share those at some yes, point but what, why don't what you, would you yeah why don't you do that because uh okay it helps people remember when there's just three to five things yeah. okay well let me let me say first of all that giving birth to a human being and raising a human being is the single most important work that can ever happen on a planet because the kind of human being this becomes is going to change the course of history for the family, for the community. It's really, really important. And it is not work that is appreciated in Western culture because the feminine is not appreciated. So here we have raising human beings being the most important work that you can possibly do. And the mother baby unit, not, not confused with how important the father or father surrogate is, the mother baby unit is one biological unit should be the center of every community. It should be the center of every governmental policy. Is it good for the mothers and babies? So, okay, so we got that wrong, but it's really important for people to understand that and this is complex. No matter what happens, it's not your fault. You, we are raised in a culture that demeans birth, that doesn't really care about babies, that really hates the feminine and all things feminine. And that means all things vulnerable. And uh, 
So it's very important as we reflect on how we were born, because I'm hoping people will go back and find out about their birth. And even if their mother is not alive, even if they were adopted and they have no idea, their body, our body knows how we were born. It's called implicit memory. It's all stored in there. So no guilt, no shame, because it, when we feel guilty or ashamed of things that we did, let's say as parents, in making decisions about birth or in allowing others to make decisions for us that turned out not to be really good, all we're doing is getting stuck. You can't make changes when you feel guilty or ashamed. And yet shame and guilt have been used for centuries to keep women in line. So women are really good at shame and guilt. So I do wanna say that it's the most important job in the world. No guilt, no shame if things didn't go the way you wanted, or if you made decisions that you wouldn't make again. The second is, and this is also hard to get, it's not our fault what happens because we are trained in a culture to do things a certain way, to believe certain things, but it is our responsibility. It is our responsibility to take this seriously and to do what we need to do to attach, to attune to our babies, to heal ourselves and our children if there have been problems. It's not our fault, but it is our responsibility. The third thing is we have to create a community of support for ourselves and our kids, starting in pregnancy, because we don't have it. We don't have communities of support. Now, Ironically, the poorest people in this country and the people most marginalized, the people who are of different color skin and have more support than white middle-class Americans. They just tend to have more extended family, but it's really important that we create support because the nuclear family is not sustainable as a unit. It's like a cell. It, it's not sustainable on its own. And it used to be extended. And now the family is shrinking. So the nuclear family is no longer two parents. It may just be one. Or it's two parents both working excessively hard and highly stressed. Or it's one working three jobs, you know. So our children are getting the worst of us. They're getting us under stress. When if there's this community of support, and we can't hold the baby right now because we're feeling really enraged or we're sobbing, there's somebody there just so we can take a shower, much less hold the baby and calm it so we can take care of ourselves. So community of supports the third. The fourth is that babies are innately intelligent and so are we and so is our body. And if we start to listen to what our body is saying at any point, and if you haven't listened in pregnancy, if we listen in labor, if we listen after because we didn't listen at birth, we begin to, to hear what our body is saying. I don't want that person holding my baby. I don't need to know why. I just don't feel comfortable in that person's presence in my labor room. You know what I mean? And, and the last thing is that babies are communicating. They're always communicating. They're always trying to engage us and get us interested and have a reciprocal conversation and to tell us their needs. Crying and moving their body are big ways that they tell us what they need. And, and a person who's really watching and listening to the baby in her care or his care is starting to attune to and discern what does that particular cry mean? And sometimes it means asking the baby, I don't get what you're saying with your crying. Please tell me. Please tell me. And one of the biggest pieces of information that I think everybody should know that I discovered only recently is that because babies are inhabiting a body for the first time, or maybe not the first time if, if you believe in other lives, but this body is new to them. So when you speak to a baby, that baby is wanting to communicate back and respond. It takes six to eight seconds for a baby, this is an infant, to 
gather itself together and get its muscles working and say something back with its body in rhythm to what has been said or with its mouth, with its eyes. Now, do we allow six to eight seconds? No, usually it's like, oh, you're such a beautiful baby. God, I love you. I can't wait till I can take you out. It's so nice. Are you smiling? I mean, that is overwhelm for a baby. And another example that I'd like to say is that these wonderful baby carriers that we have that put babies on our chest are really valuable assets. But when you put an infant, a very young baby, in one of those soft carriers with its back to you, looking out at the world, I call it babies as hood ornaments, as if they're being worn on a car, that baby has no opportunity to shut out the world. And a lot of learning and taking in the world for an infant requires going inside, turning away from the sound and the sights. And this is why being face to face or against the chest for a very young baby is really important so that it can, or in a wrap, so that the baby can just hide and then peek out when it's ready. Babies are more sensitive than we are. And subset of that is boy babies are more vulnerable, tender, and sensitive innately than girls. So they need more cuddling, more breastfeeding, not to be allowed to just cry it out. If we do these things and understand that those babies are us and that what they bring up in us often is unfinished pain and trauma when the baby cries or when the baby turns away or spits out the food, it triggers things in us. It's not about the baby. When we can understand that and go on a journey to explore our own unmet needs and our own feelings that babies bring up, we can be a lot more patient. And I say that from experience. I had this notion, because I suffered depressions, I have a bipolar condition, that if I didn't tell my daughter in the womb or when she was a baby, if I didn't tell her how I was feeling, I could keep it from her. So I didn't talk to her. I mean, it's insane. I should have been saying, oh, sweetie, I am so depressed today. It's not about you. Your job is to grow in my body and be happy and I'll get help and I'll take care of it. But it's not about you. That would be an immeasurable help. And uh, unfortunately, nobody told me that when I was having a baby. So I, that's a lot of things, but nothing people have to remember. It's all innately in there if we slow down enough to feel it. Nice. Thank you. I think uh, there are a few facts I think that are helpful for new parents to realize and community members that babies are uh, really like fetuses of other am animals. They resemble fetuses until about 18 months of age. And so they really need an external womb experience, what Ashley Montague calls womb with a view. Yep, that it's so important. Them, carrying them around, you are responding like the womb would immediately to the, what yeah. they need. Because yeah. they're growing, their brain is growing so quickly every second that any yeah, it, stress is going to throw it off. Yeah, well, we, you know, uh, we have prized so-called independence and autonomy in uh, Western culture. But really, it is being allowed to be dependent that grows the brain and the hormones and everything else in such a way that we can be radiantly self-assertive at the age of three or four. But it, yeah, it takes to eight months to a year and sometimes longer for a human infant to get to the place 
where another animal like a cow, a baby, a calf, or a foal, a, a, a horse baby, gets in the first 24 hours or less. And that is the ability to get to its feet, to follow its food source, and to flee from danger. It takes human babies till they can walk. So yeah, we need to be allowed dependency. It's so critically important. And women need to be allowed that tender, open vulnerability that occurs after a birth naturally. That's why we should have two full years of paid maternity leave and paid paternity leave for at least three to six months. It would help the economy. Yes, so there's so many uh, things that haven't been going right for birthing and pre <laughs> perinatal experiences. We haven't talked about that, but the mother getting stressed socially, I think, is worse than physical stress. Our ancestors lived through all sorts of physical stress. Big deal, yes. right? In comparison to social stress, it somehow really messes you up. And so moms who are pregnant need to be socially supported. It's really important for that baby's biochemistry to be immersed in uh, positive biochemistry, right? Yeah, it really is. And I think it's important for men and women who watch this or listen to our show to remember this fact. No mother baby, father baby, grandparent baby should be left alone with an infant for more than an hour. <laughs> this is people just get okay. That's okay. Tap some. I'd like to give parents and parents to be a tip that'll make life a lot easier for them and for their children. We are not meant to be alone a lot of the time. Isolation, unless it's freely chosen as a form of solitude to lower the stress, isolation hurts. And it hurts a woman in pregnancy, and it hurts a mother baby, and it hurts a family. Now, after birth, a mother and baby need privacy, but that's different from isolation. They need lack of stimulation, quiet, and complete time together uninterrupted for the first 24 hours. And if she chooses to have her partner, the father of the baby, or partner with her, that's fine. They need that privacy. But when people are raising very young children, especially infants, most of whom will have had trauma in their birth or stress in the womb, they should not be left alone with a baby for more than an hour. We need community. And I know this personally from women I've interviewed and from myself and the frustration I'd have in hearing my baby cry as a result of the drugs I was given that went to her body and as a result of having colic, which gets completely dismissed as, oh, it's just colic. It's not just colic, the baby's in misery. She would cry and cry and I would breastfeed her sitting in the bathtub to relax her belly. I did everything I could. And then it would trigger me and I'd wanna throw her against a wall. And I didn't, I was a nursery school teacher. I knew enough. Cognitively, you don't hurt babies, but I really needed people to take her, to give me a massage. And that's what we need to remember when we're raising infants is that we don't leave people alone with babies. <clears throat> in, our, in our ancestral context or traditional societies, mothers often lie in, right? For a month, they're, they're waited on and uh, <clears throat> the baby mom relationship is so important to support. It is, and it, it, you know, there comes a time when the mother feels really frustrated at just being <laughs> away from her normal intellectual stimulation and the world. And sometimes it's about six months where she gets stir crazy. Sometimes it's a little earlier, <laughs> but the period of time that she takes being in this nest with the baby 
will have lifelong positive benefits for both of them, for the family, and make life a hell of a lot easier for everybody in the years to come. So you're really setting the parameters, the trajectory, really, for the relationship. <clears throat> you really are. You yeah. need time to do that. You need time because if if you want to have a difficult time in toddler years or teenage years, then don't pay attention to infancy. But if you want to make that those two periods of time much easier for yourself and your children, then pay attention to life in the womb, pay attention to birth and the weeks and months afterwards and give ourselves time and nourishment and support to be with our babies and to change the national policy toward maternity and paternity leave and women working and people working at home. Well, thank you so much for these wonderful wise words that you've shared with us and ideas. Thank you, thank Suzanne. You. Everyone, uh, please look up her, her uh, websites. We'll have that information below. Thank you. It's been really good talking with you, Darsha. Thank you, Suzanne.